Hello and welcome to 3D Across ArcGIS at the 2021 Esri Developers Summit. My name is Philip Melke. I'm the 3D Web Experience Product Manager and we're joined here virtually by Steven Heidelberg, who's the 3D Core Technology Product Manager. This is a great presentation to get a broad beginner level overview of the different ways in which 3D GIS has been advancing across the ArcGIS platform. There are a lot of more a lot more in-depth sessions on developing with our APIs and SDKs. But this is a great place to come if you're uh, more of a 2D GIS developer and you want to get an overview of 3D, uh, or also if you really want to get a broader sense of some of the improvements that have been made uh, over the last year, you'll see them here as well as a road map for some of our 3D technology. So uh, to begin, one of the things that I want to share with you is uh, just a safe harbor statement. This is a forward-looking presentation, so just be advised as you're making some of your business decision, business and purchasing decisions associated with this presentation. So uh, this 3D GIS has really been um, a momentum from a variety of different data sources and capture techniques that have exploded really over the last couple of years. We've seen reality capture and design and engineering data. We're seeing really explosion in new different types of data, uh, 3D data, as well as all of the different surprising ways that uh, technology is advancing in the approach of collecting 3D data sources, whether it be LIDAR from drones, trucks, or backpacks, or the way in which uh, photogrammetric uh, textured uh, meshes have been uh, really uh, exploding on a global level. There's a lot of different ways in pipelines for the production of new 3D data types, and this is driving demand for new experiences. We've seen uh, a uh, just a surprising amount of interest and uptake in the uh, approach for understanding things like uh, uh, AR and VR or tabletop experiences like this, or the way in which uh, 3D GIS can be potentially developed upon for uh, web-based applications or mobile applications. And we've seen the expectations from consumer markets like the gaming communities that infiltrate the way that professional software product industries uh, and, and software development is occurring. And we're not really quite sure how a lot of this is going to impact in, in the long run, but we're definitely sure that it will and that it is. And so as we look at user expectations for new types of GIS experiences, a lot of them have been driven by these adjacent markets like consumers or uh, merging data analysis industry tools like uh, computational fluid dynamics. And what we've observed is that 3D has become a unifying uh, and a unifying common visual and analytical experience for GIS that really merges all of these experiences and expectations. And we're not we're finding that users aren't just adopting 3D, 3D because it's new uh, or it's just eye candy, but it's that they're adopting 3D because it has intrinsic value. It's a more accurate representation of the real world, whether you're making me measurements or uh, really trying to understand what's above or below ground. It's a, an intuitive way to communicate with non-technical stakeholders. It gives us the opportunity to visualize features that are uh, that that don't exist, uh, that are visualized thematically, or that really can't be seen given the uh, existing known environment. And it gives us a chance to really analyze behavior and aesthetics. So ArcGIS is a comprehensive 3D GIS. We've taken this approach with uh, including this explosion in data types into representing them with 3D data formats and data specifications that we share in the OGC community that we make this available and open and developable on by many uh, partners uh, like yourselves. We have made an explosion in 3D clients and experiences. So uh, we'll see geo-enabled systems, configurable applications, and the depth of the JavaScript API uh, or the runtime SDK that are all, uh, you know, that, that really are driven by developers like yourselves. 
3D analysis and simulation provides uh, great what if scenarios or the potential for things like view sheds, even on mobile devices. And we're also seeing uh, an explosion in reality capture, uh, the approach to understanding and visualizing data that uh, is like real time data, as well as looking forward to new different uh, data sources. So when we think about 3D across the platform, you know, you, you might just think specifically about uh, historically like City Engine and ArcGIS Pro kind of carrying the torch in the way that uh, 3D, 3D has been uh, uh, displayed so far by Esri. But uh, really all of these apps that you're seeing here have a place within 3D, the 3D ecosystem uh, in the ArcGIS platform. When I mentioned new data types, this is a uh, slight site scan drone to map and in frame sure are all examples uh, or places in which we're uh, understanding the development of integrated mesh and uh, really using photogrammetric and LIDAR sources to combine and, pr and to produce uh, data types. We're getting uh, design and construction data from uh, CAD and, uh, and engineering uh, agencies with ArcGIS for AutoCAD and ArcGIS GeoBIM. And of course, there's the weight of the desktop pro products that have improved over the years, ArcGIS City Engine, and especially ArcGIS Pro. Uh, and we've made new improvements with ArcGIS Earth, which makes it a very light and thin client to use. Uh, we have configurable applications, ArcGIS Story Maps, Web App Builder, Experience Builder. These all utilize the web scenes in a way that really creates rich visual experiences, but also that are configurable to provide feedback for some of your workflows that your clients may be adopting, as well as uh, mobile experiences with ArcGIS Earth Mobile, uh, Field Maps and Collector. You might not think that those are especially 3D focused, but they do collect Z uh, information with precision GPS. All of our developer tools with ArcGIS App Studio Runtime uh, or ArcGIS API for JavaScript, ArcGIS Runtime SDKs, as well as our online experience with Scene Viewer, ArcGIS Online, and all of that data with Living Atlas. Continuing on this, we have some geo-enabled systems, ArcGIS Urban and ArcGIS Indoors, which are all based off of our 3D uh, JavaScript API uh, and are extensible through a variety of different APIs that you can check out in some of these sessions. My point with this in, in bringing all of this up is that the ArcGIS platform is pretty broad and there are common threads throughout all of this as far as the approach of understanding, working, and serving these data types. So we decided to take the approach within this presentation, focusing on some of the capabilities. So you'll see first with Steven Heidelberg are uh, some of our improvements in their approach to uh, visual experience. So Steven, why don't you take it from here? Thanks, Phil. My name is Steve Heidelberg. I'm going to be covering visualization capabilities across the ArcGIS platform. So this is a very exciting topic for me to be covering because I think it's a hot topic. I think it's something that uh, has been improving pretty quickly over time. And I think uh, you, the users, have really shown that you want to enhance the storytelling capabilities of your JS data, especially in 3D. So the capabilities that we've added in and then are, current, are going to continue to add in, I think are pretty exciting. Some of these capabilities are animation and temporal data, the ability to take time enabled data, display it and play it back in a realistic way, uh, produce movies from it, such as MP4 and GIFs and share that content easily to places like YouTube or maybe through an email. Um, also display improvements with the ability to view shadows and lighting in a more realistic way through ambient inclusion or else temporally viewing your lighting or performing some type of lighting analysis is all possible within 3D. And you're seeing some of this in the movie to the right hand side. And one thing I want to point out in this movie is uh, a lot of these capabilities are um, across the platform. It's not just solely within the desktop applications such as ArcGIS Pro, such as water, which I'll point out later. Uh, you're, you can view water and its reflectivity and motion and so forth uh, in story maps and then also ArcGIS Pro. Uh, city engine and so forth. So it's a really visualization capabilities that's being distributed across a platform. And we're trying to do this in a um, cohesive expected way. Uh, we're also making virtual and augmented reality capabilities a little bit easier. 
we're doing this through um, bridges built for the game engine through the RTS SDK for game engines, and then also City Engine provides uh, templates and workflows that let you create virtual reality experiences that ultimately you can view on a headset such as the Oculus. So how things look is ultimately about what type of story you can tell of your GS data. And a lot of these highlighted things I'm bringing up that we've made improvements on or features that we've added in Ultimately, I think let you guys tell a better story with your JS data, it lets you reach a broader audience, lets your data be more accessible, not only through ex exploration and interactivity, but also the ability to create a story such as a, a movie and so forth and share it with your audience. So some of these areas that have been enhanced or added are voxel rendering. If you have volumetric data, such as subterranean or atmospheric, you can view it in a compelling way. You can explain it to your audience because that type of data tends to be very complex. And uh, the tools and visualization capabilities of voxel rendering enable you to kind of take that data and uh, reach your audience with it. You're noticing that in the, in the upper right-hand corner, this is a movie that was generated from ArcGIS Pro showing uh, an animation of voxels. Then also shading and ambient inclusion improves overall how shadows are viewed. If you have a complex environment, such as an urban environment, oftentimes uh, if shadows aren't rendered properly, the features might blend together and it's difficult to distinguish the depth of a scene. In the lower right-hand corner, you see a city here. In the foreground, it's bright. In the background, it's dark. This is ultimately because of ambient inclusion. It's adding the appropriate shadow and depth to the scene. Ultimately, it's just making it look more photorealistic. Then also materials, and there's a lot of different levels to how materials is being enhanced. Uh, there's reflectivity with water. So when you view water, water has motion, but it also has specular and reflective highlights and so forth. Um, the ability to consume GLTF or GLB markers this gives you the ability to also consume PBR materials that have specularity or bump maps. In the lower left-hand corner, there is a police car or SWAT car. You notice as it's uh, orbited or rotated around, there's specular highlights rolling across the paint. As it's rolling across it, you can see you know, the bump map on it or the little imperfections of the paint. So what this ultimately means is that you can consume a GLTF marker with these PBR materials and it's gonna be honored. And that means you can um, potentially author it in a specialized modeling package such as Blender or so forth. And any sort of materials that have been set up with it are gonna be honored. So, with ambient inclusion, you also have enhanced lighting. So not only the ability to view shadows in a more realistic way, but also the overall lighting model is going to show your scene in a realistic way as well. And that can be temporal. You can actually display a certain time of day and we'll try to visualize that um, selected time in an accurate way. So you can do maybe exploratory analysis of shadows, look at how shadows are casting and so forth for a specific time of day water across the platform so you not only can view water with reflectivity and then states of motion in ArcGIS Pro but you also can view it in ArcGIS Online or in Story Maps City Engine as well so across the platform we're trying to uh, give you the ability to enhance your visualization um, and we're doing this specifically with water so water is not just something that you're going to see in ArcGIS Pro. Uh, better visualization and symbology overall. This has to do with um, a lot of different things, but transparency sorting contributes to this. If you have many different symbols in the scene, uh, it's going to ultimately render in a more compelling way. Better stylized content, such as sketch edges or solid edges. I mentioned before, there's two ways you can really look at your data. If I want to simplify things, photorealistic or realistic, and then stylized. And sketch edges and solid edges gives you this stylized look, like an inked look that's on the outside of your features or model. This ultimately, I think, lets your users look at something that's very complex, such as an urban environment, and process it and understand it a little bit easier. So in the center image here, 
the highlighted buildings are very distinguishable from the rest of its background or surrounding elements because of the way it's being viewed. And then lastly, enhanced LIDAR rendering or last rendering. Uh, you can easily absorb the base map colors and push it into the LIDAR data. Um, also, there's enhanced depth sorting for the LIDAR data as well. So we've been making a lot of progress in integrating with game engines. Game engines are very powerful tools to visualize your data. Um, they provide a lot of interactivity. They definitely have their use, especially in the areas of creating some type of VR or AR experience. And so we see this uh, potential there and then also the need. So we've been building these bridges to help you take your data into game engines such as Unreal and Unity. So we're building tools and connections to make using game engines easier for you. And we're doing this through the RTS Maps SDK for game engines. And then also with City Engine and VR workflows. Um, so you can create tabletop experiences and so forth within AR. Ultimately, this will enable you to take your GIS data, enhance it, and then show it maybe in a headset such as Oculus and so forth. So this is somewhere we're going to continue to explore. Um, and I think it's a very interesting area. And there's a lot of potential here if you want to um, enhance your data in a photorealistic manner with a lot of detail. In addition to the game engine integration efforts, there's further ways that you can actually create virtual and augmented reality solutions, such as RTS 360 VR. It's a mobile VR app that's lightweight, lets you author a hotspot navigation, um, which ultimately lets you control where your user interacts or views the environment it creates a 360 visibility. And you can see the center screen of the slide. Uh, next to City Engine VR, it's a premium VR app for HTC Vive and Oculus Rift. Uh, you can learn more about it in the lower left-hand corner. I provided a link. Uh, it creates a tabletop experience through templates, and it also has improved interactive tools, sun positioning and lighting, and realistic water animation. And lastly, RTS Runtime, which takes advantage of the device sensors, transparent background, and also has stereo display. So you can enhance your GIS data through uh, various visualization features that we've been talking about, but you also can share it with others through animation and temporal exploration. And what that really means is that you can share it to movies, you can explore it with exploratory analysis tools, but you can capture this with keyframes. So if you're using exploratory analysis tools, such as Slice, as you're seeing center screen here, you can capture it with keyframes and animate it and ultimately share it to a movie. Some of the areas of improvements have been display and function curve edits, which lets you refine your camera motion, uh, animation of the time and range slider. You're seeing that in the center screen or the lower center screen, there's animation of water that's been done through uh, the time and range slider. The ability to animate voxels, animation of exploratory analysis tools such as the view shed and view dome. And then you can publish to many popular media formats. And I mentioned you can do this very easily. So you can create GIFs, MP4, and AVIs, and so forth, and ultimately get your work out to a wider audience by distributing it on platforms like YouTube or Vimeo. And then lastly, RTS Earth's extended animation tool set. All right, thank you, Stephen. So uh, now we're going to take a look at some of our uh, 3D analysis capabilities that we have in ArcGIS. And one of the first ones to note is the way in which we're uh, better understanding and working with LiDAR data. And so we've enacted some uh, tools in our toolbar, which then uh, work with geoprocessing tools in order to classify LAS, and that's ground buildings, overlap, noise, or vegetation by height. The other aspect here that you'll see within this uh, view in the top right is our profile view. And that's a mechanism that's also very helpful for that cl uh, last classification because uh, then you can identify directly there as you draw a line for an area, um, really what, what specific sections of that you can select uh, different pieces of that last and then use it for classification. We've introduced feature proximity also for the process of trying to understand its selection and classification 
of LiDAR data, and uh, finally the Colorize Last tool, which will allow you to use uh, Orthophoto uh, to uh, ascribe RGB values to that last that you can then publish as a point cloud scene layer and share uh, online in a variety of different ways. Really a beautiful uh, product from that if your last doesn't already have uh, uh, RGB values associated with it. We've also been uh, working uh, towards uh, P point CNN uh, deep learning modules for classification. So you'll see this in some of our uh, upcoming 3D base map solutions, which also help to walk through some of those geoprocessing tools to produce uh, a form of classification of that last data. All right, we also have uh, 3D exploratory analysis tools. We'll uh, introduce uh, another exploratory analysis tool for UC, but for now what we have, Pro Earth and the Scene Viewer, the JavaScript API, Line of Sight, View Dome, View Sheds, Slices, and Cut and Fill tools. So um, in order to give you a deeper impression of that, uh, Steve is going to uh, share a little demonstration with you that highlights specifically what some of these exploratory analysis tools are. We're going to take a look at several exploratory analysis tools, and we're going to start off with the view shed to analyze why uh, a certain window position on a very expensive piece of real estate is uh, valued so potentially so high or maybe a little bit lower than expected. Um, this is on 432 Park Avenue. It's one of the most expensive condos in New York because of its view of Central Park. So we're going to create observer from camera view shed from the point of view that we're looking at. We're then going to extend the maximum view uh, to 1600, which is going to encompass the entire Central Park. And as we pull out from the view shed that was created, you'll notice that the green indicates visible area from the window and the red indicates what's obstructed. And we notice right away there's a large obstructed region in the front. And you know, since these condominiums are $20 million and up, this might be a concern. Um, I personally would like any sort of view, you know, uh, of Central Park, but for someone spending that type of money, an analysis of this might actually be valuable because if you want to actually see this, the park or the front of the park, it would have been uh, not visible. Here we have a intersection and we're going to utilize view sheds on two cameras to um, get an idea of what's visible as a car passes through the intersection. So these two traffic cameras are already positioned in there with, and they have two point markers. We're gonna go ahead and use from layer to generate the view sheds from there. So there's already data associated to a table that establishes how big these view sheds should be or the extent of the view sheds. Now we can see utilizing the range slider playing back the car as it passes through the intersection, what's visible and not visible. Once again, visible is the green area. Red is not visible to the cameras. And then overlapping area, which is yellow. You can easily uh, change the view shed angles, the distance. You can do this interactively. Additionally, you can also set keyframes on these view sheds. So if you want to create a movie, or some type of experience that you play back through animation. That's very easy to do. As I change the, the view shed, you notice that uh, the yellow shows overlap between the two. And so that is an area of coverage that both the cameras see. Next, we're gonna take a look at utilizing Slice to cut through a BIM model. This is really effective for any model that is highly complex, that has multiple levels and you wanna explore the model as opposed to trying to actually navigate through it, which can be very um, difficult to do in 3D space. You can use the slice tool to go ahead and cut through the model to view various levels or various floors very easily. And that'll expose things like walls, uh, layout of the building at particular floor levels, uh, what potentially what type of furniture that is within the building as well. You can also cut a region of the building um, and you can do this from interactive volume. There's several different shapes you can make. I'm utilizing a box shape here. That box shape is gonna let me actually cut right into a room. I can rescale it and move it around and explore the a subsection or a smaller part of the building. Here we have an urban scenario. We're gonna take a look at if a presenter and a small audience is susceptible to an IED utilizing a view dome. 
I've already placed a view dome. There's keyframe set on it. So I want to show you how you can use multiple workflows, the exploratory analysis tools in conjunction with animation to make this analysis. We notice here the yellow area shows that the speaker is susceptible um, to any type to some type of damage from that IED. So we're going to make a small change. We're going to set a barrier up on the street between that space uh, of the trees. The nice thing about um, exploratory analysis tools is when you place objects in, nothing else has to be set up. The analysis tools, uh, in this case that have been keyframed, will immediately pick up the change that has been made. So in this case, you're seeing that the barrier um, is going to shield the presenter and the audience. So it moves through the trees, the trees are still shielding, but the barrier also in the red area is showing that it's protecting the presenter and the audience. All right, thank you for that, Stephen. And now uh, just continuing the 3D analysis discussion, voxels, it's a, uh, well, it's all, both a data type, a data format, a storage format, but also an analysis mechanism that we use to visualize large volumetric data. A voxel you can think of essentially as a 3D raster where we're uh, storing data within uh, a three-dimensional pixel, a uh, voxel, and uh, then we're able to utilize the uh, we're able to utilize the G GPU in order to more quickly visualize large volumetric data sets. So in the case here in the lower right of GeoTop, uh, what we're seeing is uh, actually uh, about 30 gigabytes of lithographic data for the Netherlands that we're able to very quickly um, uh, navigate to separate and to understand. Uh, really the segmentation of that data. We can create slices with uh, rotatable planes. We can create isosurfaces of this data. And we can also um, receive this data source that's NetCDF uh, through uh, 3D empirical Bayesian Krieging workflows. Um, or uh, NetCDF is also a product of the space-time cube that can now be visualized with voxels. I just wanted to show you an example of a workflow here where we were able to use, utilize voxels for visualization. We're using 3D empirical Bayesian Krieging to interpolate soil density values in the boreholes that you can see as points within this under an airport. And in this, we're able to use voxel uh, symbology to, to provide a transparency to that symbology so that we get a sense of where's the difference between clay and sandy soil uh, under this larger, pieces of, larger piece of infrastructure. We're able to use layer sections in order to visualize uh, cross sections, both horizontal and vertically, um, so that we can really understand that interaction point that occurs. Here in this case, we're using an isosurface to visualize that dense soil or clay um, under uh, this piece of infrastructure, ultimately so that we're able to showcase where we're getting the uh, uh, cross friction on some of the caissons. Uh, Voxels also recently in Pro have the ability to, to work with the timeline so that you can animate and produce visualizations of voxel layers with the animation uh, timeline so that you're ultimately able to produce these MP4s uh, or videos of, uh, of voxel data so that you can understand things like change over time here in this case or uh, the slice in the previous case and you can animate that slice. So um, that's voxel layers, that's an analysis methodology, it's a storage mechanism for data, and we'll see some improvements with this here uh, this summer over UC. Uh, finally, one of the pieces with 3D analysis, one, what I just want to make you aware of are the solutions that utilize uh, our geoprocessing services, some of our point CNN learning modules, but ultimately are able to deliver a task-based workflow so that you're able to deliver off of your industry-based uh, workflows so that uh, 3D base map solution can ultimately uh, is used to with only the footprint and LIDAR data, with building footprints and LIDAR data, you can uh, accurately, uh, or you can derive accurate roof forms and 3D objects of buildings, as well as um, uh, create vegetation and uh, the elevation service, and so that you can really have a solid 3D base map that you can produce some of these experiences on. All right, uh, now our next section that we want to talk about is 3D content creation, editing, and data management. As we started this presentation, uh, the, we made the statement that uh, you know data 
new data sources, new data capture techniques are ultimately driving a lot of how we're approaching uh, 3D. And all, all of these are very true. So, uh, you know, one of the things to begin with that I think helps to helps you to understand how well 3D is, uh, is being supported by the legacy of the ArcGIS platform is that uh, a great example here is distributed collaboration is something that a lot of our users are, are, are used to when it comes to two-dimensional workflow. And that's a trusted connections that occur between ArcGIS Enterprise uh, to Enterprise or online. And it gives you the ability to uh, share data and information across these systems uh, securely so that you can then organization to organization can communicate with each other, not only through maps, but through scenes and all of this 3D data, so that it's, uh, it, it gives that secure sharing perspective across uh, multiple organizations. So this could play out in a very specific kind of way. Let's say you have uh, a, a, a BIM or an architecture engineering and construction based workflow in which you're utilizing the building scene layer. Uh, technically, Land Records is the legal entity that's housing this data, but several other organizations need access to this data, a very accurate view of the building, where it stands, and all the assets that are surrounding in order to support their own individual work functions. An architect needs to view this just as much as municipal engineering needs to view it, but for different reasons. Municipal engineering needs to identify the, the development impact fee that's associated with it, how it is that you can bring uh, what level of water, sewer, and uh, other services to it. And in the same way, public safety is concerned about keeping this area safe, uh, both in construction and afterwards. And the construction group has a different measure of safety, a different uh, set of tools that are associated with safety. But everybody, uh, all of these entities need access to this data or need to be able to share data with each other. And they're able to do that using distributed collaboration. You know, organizations talking to organizations with the language of maps and data. And uh, it's never been more true than with 3D data. So some of the things with uh, content creation and, and data management, one of the main things to understand is a scene layer. And what is a scene layer? So scene layers uh, are the uh, a, a cache that uses this uh, open standard I3S to serve performant 3D experiences. It's a multiple level of detail cache so that, you know, depending on where you where you are, what your level of view is, what you, where your camera is placed within that 3D view, it enables the quickest possible mechanism for you to be able to consume that on clients. So with that, there are some things to understand about it. Uh, ArcGIS Pro, City Engine, third-party vendors can author I3S, these scene layers, and they can be published using Pro. Um, they can be published directly as an SLPK to ArcGIS Online, or can be referred to in uh, in uh, by ArcGIS Enterprise. And you can consume this in Pro, Scene Viewer, Earth, Runtime, ArcGIS, Earth Mobile, a variety of clients. And this can also be maintained by ArcGIS Pro, and as we'll soon see, um, also by the JavaScript API for editing uh, editing 3D data. All of this uh, is important to keep in mind because this is a common element when it comes to scene layers, but there are a variety of scene layer types. So let's take a little tour through them. First, point scene layers. These are points, uh, you know, and in this case, what we're looking at in the bottom right is a space-time cube that's representative of the water consumption month by month over an entire year for all of these properties here in Redlands in, in this case. And we're able to use styling on the attributes that are housed within that scene layer in order to really uh, efficiently visualize what it is that we're uh, trying to understand with that attribute data. Uh, point, uh, point scene layers can be visualized uh, by 3D objects, by 2D objects. They can be a foundation from which uh, what 3D web styles are drawn from. And this is an example of one of those. So uh, with our recent uh, 1.7 spec for point scene layers, we're able to consume a larger volume of these points. And here we're representing them as uh, 3D web styles that are representative of trees. These are also attribute driven. Uh, you know, the type of tree in this case, the height, the rotation of the tree are all attributes that drive how this is visualized. And so in this experience that we're viewing here, uh, this is 150,000 trees and that's made possible through the more recent uh, uh, spec increase for the point cloud scene layer or for the point scene layer, excuse me. Which brings me 
to our 3D object scene layer. Uh, this is also a fairly common type. Uh, you know, the, in this case, in the bottom right, what you're seeing is 3D object scene layers that are representative of the entire city of New York. Uh, and we're seeing detailed roof forms, uh, you know, very, very detailed buildings, uh, and uh, vegetations that are vegetation that's representative here. A 3D object scene later can be labeled, it can be symbolized in a variety of different ways from attribute driven symbology. And uh, we're able to serve a large volume of 3D content using the 3D object scene layer. Point cloud scene layer. This is the mechanism that we use to serve uh, LIDAR and FODAR data, um, all of the derived uh, different data products that, that uh, a lot of our customers are used to working with. Uh, recently, we're able to in use uh, pop-ups on, on each individual point for the point cloud scene layers. We can visualize this data in Scene Viewer and in uh, Pro and uh, other clients using uh, RGB values so that we can visualize these with color, class, uh, classification. Uh, with, we can visualize them by elevation and also by intensity. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of different options that you have for generating point cloud scene layers with the density of the point cloud. Uh, and in this case, what we're viewing in the lower right is uh, we've been navigating through an entire state's inventory of LiDAR that's all being served performantly online. You know, not just for us, the end users, but really what's interesting about this is that this is for every, every city, every local government, every agency within Connecticut that needs access to this point cloud. Well, rather than, you know, the, the previous method of trying to provide LAS in a tile that would be downloaded, now this is just a service that's being hosted in ArcGIS Online that is easily accessed for a uh, large, large volume of end users. So here we're taking a look at the integrated mesh scene layer. So this is uh, integrated mesh is the, the combination of imagery and geometry. And this is kind of a, a skin of the earth model, as it's been called before. Uh, we've seen and we've been making a lot of improvements with our utilization of integrated mesh data. Uh, you know, this is typically derived from photogrammetric sources, if it's either drone to map or site scan. And um, well, let's just get into some of the improvements that we've made for this recently. So this first is a look at uh, imagery capture and generation solutions. So uh, utilizing drone to map, site scan, or uh, in frame sure, we're able to process uh, either smaller areas with the drone based mapping products or uh, tremendously large city size uh, or state size scale with sure end frames so that we're able to produce uh, a variety of different things, uh, including integrated mesh. ArcGIS Pro is, as uh, we'd seen previously in some of the analysis section, is able to do some feature extraction detection, some classification, 3D base map management, and all of these are a part of that overall workflow of imagery and remote sensing um, to how we're managing that data and extracting and deriving value from it and then managing it afterwards. So with integrated mesh, uh, a couple of the things that we've improved recently, this is first an example of mesh modification. So uh, we're, this is a city scale integrated mesh, but we want to just take a look at a very specific location. And so here we're adding the modification of, of masking. And what this will do is we're highlighting a, a specific block here, and we're really masking out everything that's around that, that area. Um, you know, this is mesh modification. We're not talking about actual mesh editing here in this case, but it allows us the chance to do um, different things that our users require for our workflows. And so in this case, what we're seeing here is the ability to replace or to push that mesh down, say if we wanted to um, now um, insert a, uh, uh, say, a building scene layer that's representative of an improvement project or uh, a th a uh, any other type of data that we, we want to highlight for a specific area. Sometimes that's used to say a city scale uh, mesh can be replaced with a more recent uh, drone flights integrated mesh. And so what can you do with this integrated mesh? Well, you can drape features to it. And in this case, we're looking at a lot of 2D data that's draped over this integrated mesh 3D context that's really just made alive by um, the context that 3D provides here in this case. Here I'm uh, clicking on individual sections. Uh, this, these are 
are really just features, the 2D polygons then that are draped over the top of it, where we now have attributes about commercial energy use, residential energy use here in Melbourne. And I think this is a really interesting uh, example. We're, we're also draping water styling over the top of... Uh, over the top of this so that you can see, um, you know, the river uh, actually animate and, and uh, change over time with that water mesh uh, visualization. Or, uh, so this example here with uh, uh, our content types is the building scene layer. So new for the building scene layer is the ability to search uh, all, all of the, uh, you know, the, the potential detail of building scene layer. We're able to consume Revit as a data source, you know, from Autodesk with our relationship with Autodesk, and then publish it uh, on lot for consuming on the web or in ArcGIS Pro. And this search function really helps us to manage the complexity of that data, so we can search through specific families and entities and try to find, uh, you know, specific pieces. If this is either a solar panel or a room or uh, other entities that exist within that uh, Revit data, um, being able to search and to find it here within scene layer is a valuable thing. And so we've seen a lot of really interesting examples that aren't really just buildings. So in this case, this is infrastructure that we're looking at. This is an electrical substation in France. And we're seeing the, uh, you know, the complexity of this design. It provides a fa fantastic base map. We can search through different construction phases where we can then uh, identify individual disciplines and categories of the data. So all of these different subtypes that are within that Revit data. And um, we can supplement that with other data, 2D data that may be representative in this case of uh, some of our, of our additional infrastructure that's supporting this Revit-based infrastructure. You know, you gotta show those connection points to something that's a very uh, complex engineering design. Another example of a building scene layer used a little bit more for that that kind of infrastructure types of scenario here. This is uh, this is amazing. Uh, it's a very large uh, Revit uh, uh, piece of Revit that, in this case, we're showing a more recent utilization of consuming the textures that can be found within Revit. And you really get a sense of scale. This uh, train, not only a single train station, but an entire train line that's supported by integrated mesh in this specific area so that we can see, um, you know, we can see really how this, this uh, planned uh, rail could affect the city. And so it's, it really becomes not only a foundation for understanding the construction, but now GIS and the meeting of BIM and GIS is a place in which we're really communicating larger scale plans uh, with the community as they are our uh, greatest stakeholders as we're uh, moving forward with development in, uh, you know, in the world. So uh, building scene layers can really play a foundational role in how we understand and uh, work with 3D GIS. And it also represents a marriage of a variety of different software industries that are driving the way that, 3D, that GIS, 3D GIS is modernizing GIS. All right, another piece of content creation, editing and data management. This is about understanding the relationship between scene layers and uh, their associated feature layer. So whenever you publish a scene layer, that large cached item that in that really enables the the quick performant viewing of 3D content, behind the scenes there's a feature layer, an associated feature layer that's editable. This is one of those that you would maintain that data through the associated feature layer, and then you're you're able to use this as a mechanism to then uh, to then rebuild this at a later point when all of the uh, the data is at a point in which it's satisfactory and it's been brought up to date so that the cache is rebuilt and it's made later for consumption. So a new uh, to uh, uh, new, new, newly supported in our last release for scene viewer is the ability to actually edit the associated feature label. And so attributes in a 3D object scene layer are visible at the point of editing as long as the client has access to that associated feature layer so that you can see things uh, change in real time. This may be uh, mo more along the lines of watching uh, uh, status of real estate buildings change. Um, that, that, that's something that you can see before a cache is rebuilt. So it gives the opportunity for 3D GIS uh, to play more of a role in a real time look at a system of record. 
And um, this also gives a couple of different uh, other types of functionality so that we're able to view, uh, we're able to uh, utilize that associated feature layer, in this case for, uh, for pop-ups, so that we're, we're able to view um, here as a 3D object scene layer that a web configurable pop-up has been configured uh, on that associated feature layer, uh, that associated feature layer, so that we're able to con use utilize Arcade and all of the great tools that we have, and that uh, people have made an investment in understanding in 2D GIS. Th those can also be supported with scene layers with that associated feature layer. So feature layers, uh, you know, they are the non-cached kind of typical uh, GIS data that we're used to working with, I think, within 2D. So that, um, you know, the uh, all of the, the water lines that are maintained within a utility system of record, well, those can just be grabbed and visualized uh, with uh, uh, smart mapping styling so that we can extrude those with tubular visualizations given the diameter of the pipe. It's all attribute driven. Top right, we're seeing an example of 3D extrusion of 2D footprints get with a height value as an attribute so that we're able to then, in this case, visualize uh, um, Vancouver with uh, 3D extrusions. Relatively uh, quick and easy way to make the, this kind of uh, visualization of a 3D city. Bottom left, we're seeing some of our water styling. And again, these are feature layers. These are 2D feature layers that are draped over the top of the surface that are really uh, now, um, I think, made more of a, a concrete part of the scene with a, a three-dimensional visualization. So water styling, which also recently includes uh, um, the ability to, uh, uh, to ref with reflective surfaces so that we can see what's behind the scenes there. Uh, so feature layers are how you're going to want to serve your 3D real-time data. This is an example here in the bottom right where we're setting the refresh layer interval in the item view for that feature layer, and that's honored in scene viewers. So we're able to consume real live um, uh, interior positioning system, in this case of security guards throughout, uh, throughout a complex so that we can see where, uh, where people are and we can you know, combine that with line of sight so that it really fits the needs of site security. But uh, yeah, we're able to consume uh, live uh, data and uh, really make that a part of your 3D view. Another thing about feature layers is that they're uh, web configurable so that you can uh, utilize uh, all of the things that you're used to working with within 2D GIS. Uh, you know, the pop-ups as we'd seen before, 2D billboard symbology, multi-field filtering, extent filtering, or that refresh rate. Those are all things that you would configure within that item visualization tab. If you want to read a little bit more about this uh, and the ways in which you can utilize feature layers within, uh, within your uh, common operating picture, uh, delivering your common operating picture with 3D is a, uh, a blog that we have that, that uh, you can look into a little bit more detail. Other things with content management, we've uh, uh, added support for in-feature snapping. So uh, we're, we're, we've been working on uh, editing on the web, uh, and that's something that you can utilize now through the JavaScript API with uh, points, lines, and polygons that can produce a variety of, uh, of experiences. And that's where we're, we're um, you know, we're where we're at right now is really focusing on the improvement of those uh, those editing experiences for uh, those end clients. So in feature snapping, what you're seeing there is the ability to you know understand you know drawing a footprint can be a really difficult task if you don't have a guide for understanding perpendicular and parallel lines, and that's what we had just seen there with an example. So uh, more on the data management side is also the consideration for working with large I3S uploads. Uh, so the uh, first thing with enterprise, what you need to be aware of is that you must install and configure a tile cache data store for working with 3D GIS. Uh, that's, that's just one of the basics, but it's something that's kind of easy to overlook if you're not aware about what you need uh, in, within your enterprise configuration and implementation. So uh, that mostly I'm just saying that for awareness here in this case. Another thing for awareness is that we're able to directly um, uh, publish content from larger file stores like S3 buckets or other uh, um, kind of online enterprise uh, file stores, which is uh, very useful because it reduces the uh, 
uh, reduces the amount of time for consumption for this, as well as uh, all of the disk resource space that you may need there. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at this blog here to see about uh, if you if you are in that scenario where you need to publish large scene layers. Let's take a look at products supporting 3D workflows across the ArcGIS platform. A Premier Desktop application, ArcGIS Pro, has advanced in, or enhanced capabilities in exploratory analysis tools. This gives you the ability to interactively analyze your data with line of sight, view shed, view dome, and slice by plane or volume capability, which can be applied to visible scene layer, layers. Additionally, the new cut and fill tool. There's also 3D editing and modeling. You can directly edit file formats like OBJ, DAE, multi-patch features, and scene layers with new precision editing tools. Additionally, the new tool of explode, merge, and slice multi-patch. And then as mentioned before, there's enhancements to realistic visualizations. This includes ambient inclusion, which improves shadows, high dome lighting, material support and markers, which encompasses GLTF and the ability to consume PBR materials, and the water fill symbol. Additionally, the 3D object scene layer symbology, smart mapping functionality to stylize 3D layers, similar to the web scene viewer, and then animation for static and dynamic storytelling. So you can create rich animations with 3D content. This means that you can create overlays such as images, text, and graphics. You can configure these with time settings and ultimately export it to movie formats. And then lastly, last classification. You can classify building rooftops, ground and vegetation LIDAR, and a new profile view helps manually classify LIDAR. Another desktop application is Esri's City Engine, which helps with building urban environments through various automation and procedural generation techniques. Some of the added features are instant quantitative visibility assessments. So detailed statistics have been added to the ViewShed and ViewDome tools that quantify visibility qualities as inputs to assessment valuation tools. Like ArcGIS Pro, you can consume GLTF models which means you also can consume PBR materials. And in addition to that, in City Engine, you can export them. Web publishing of elevation data, so you can export a terrain layer as an elevation tile package. City Engine plugin for Houdini. So if Houdini is within your tool set or workflow, uh, there's a plugin for you to bring your City Engine data into it. CGA operations for urban design. You can clean up inaccurate building footprints, control setback distances, and enable better encoding of urban design practices. And lastly, Premier VR experience for urban planning reviews. So two new templates for Unreal Engine for real-time visualizations and intuitive tabletop experience. Continuing the overview of our product line, this is Scene Viewer. This is the component of ArcGIS Online and Enterprise that's used to author and serve uh, large performance scenes and all of the data that can be housed within ArcGIS Online or Enterprise. Uh, it utilizes the uh, ArcGIS API for JavaScript in the background here. So a lot of the features and functionalities that you'll see with the JavaScript API, uh, you'll see uh, show in Scene Viewer as well. Some of those recently have been animated water visualizations, uh, the ability to visualize large uh, feature data sets, feature layers, uh, smart mapping for line and polygon styles uh, so that you can see extrusions uh, of polygons like what we had seen before or the extruded pipes. Uh, we can search for features in web scenes and in Building Explorer, we can use the floor picker, construction phase, uh, and, and be able to isolate individual families and disciplines. And we also have improved underground navigation with context-aware navigation. ArcGIS Earth is a lightweight client, it's a desktop client that is uh, really doing more than just what uh, previously uh, what was set in, in its path as a Google Earth replacement story uh, where it would support uh, KML. Uh, it's both a desktop application and there's an Earth mobile client. Uh, visualizations using uh, and measurements, uh, the ability to edit and uh, work with uh, KML editing, um, the uh, um, the uh, 
ability to consume from portals. All of these are components which help to make this a, a really a great fit for uh, just as much the Intel community as it does for the education community. So again, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a lightweight client that you can pick up and utilize now. We have several configurable apps that are tools for the field office in the community. And uh, as I mentioned, ArcGIS Earth, and we also previously mentioned drone to map and site scan, which are more drone-based workflows. They're scene viewer, but uh, what I wanna focus now is about those configurable apps that consume those, uh, consume those individual scenes that are authored within scene viewer. And a little bit about what that experience looks like. So uh, with ArcGIS Online and ArcGIS Enterprise, data is typically uh, published and hosted either using Pro, City Engine, or third-party clients where it's uh, ultimately um, housed within ArcGIS Enterprise, scene layers and feature layers. We then use those to both read read those layers and 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 potentially write to those layers, utilizing that um, ArcGIS uh, JavaScript API. And we have some ready-to-use applications like Scene Viewer, which is used to explore, analyze, author, and share. But then these configurable apps of Story Maps, Exper Experience Builder, Web App Builder, and uh, configurable app templates, as well as uh, you know your your own custom coded application. This is an example of one of our configurable apps that have just been recently um, uh, recently uh, introduced into the ArcGIS platform. And it's a really an, an amalgam of a couple of different uh, previous ones where Scene Within Set Map and the basic 3D viewer now uh, has a bit of an update. So you can see the slice tool actually uses uh, a more advanced slicing function. So you can grab a handle and actually angle that slice function, which is a little different than Scene Viewer. And we also have the uh, capability to, in the top right, you can see we can cycle through all the slides or you know bookmarks as you would see it within 3D. But this is one that I'm really excited about is that we have the capability of utilizing uh, the JavaScript API widget that produces these, this line of sight function. So as we're drawing this line, you'll see uh, you know green is visible and red is where it becomes invisible. It gives you the opportunity to analyze directly within scenes like this so that you can understand visibility. It has tremendous uh, application in a variety of different industries. This is an example uh, with Experience Builder, which is really moving along in its way in which it, it's uh, able to uh, make a configurable application experience. So uh, here in this use case, what we're seeing, we're just switching back and forth between a 2D web map and a, and a 3D scene. Within the scene is integrated mesh where we're draping special event uh, features on top of. Uh, and so in this case, this is a diesel spill response um, over a lot of integrated mesh that's been generated from end frames. And we're able to utilize uh, some widgets within Experience Builder. This is a configurable experience again. Uh, that was just the turntable where we're able to view a specific area. We can search in this list widget on the right hand side to find things like the command post and zoom directly to it with an action trigger that we've configured within Experience Builder. Here's an example for... Um, uh, now, another configurable apps is Story Maps, and this specific Story Map is uh, is one that's devoted to 3D cadaster. And so, some of the things that you'll see here, we're consuming a web scene directly, and uh, switching between slides actually gives a little bit more of an animation uh, alpha transparency fade function. And um, in this example, uh, what we'll see is ultimately we're expressing a narrative along with that scene. We're moving along from slide to slide, uh, uh, which is then providing us a new look at the data, uh, not only in the camera view, but what data is added to it. So last but not least, what's coming for 3D at Esri? So in the near term, they're snapping in the scene viewer, elevation profile tool, faster voxel display, i3s SDK and mesh LOD generation, and frame sure reality capture acquisition. In the midterm, we have RTS Earth rights to services, savable scene layer symbol configuration, composite scene layer, open street map derived buildings, global scene layers, 3D object feature layer, and Cesium JS reading i3s. And then in the long term, we have 3D support for dashboards, 3D widgets and experience builder, support for material properties, voxel scene layer for web sharing, point cloud data management for scene layers, and RTS Earth API.
Stephen, I would like to thank you for attending this session, and we hope that this has been a useful overview of 3D across the ArcGIS platform. Just as a reminder, we do have a survey for you to take, and you can find that link at the bottom of the video. So thanks again, and feel free to get in touch with either Stephen or I with questions.